Awesome. Welcome. We'll get started here in just a minute. We'll give people a moment to sign on. Hi, everyone on Facebook. Hi, anyone on Zoom. If you're just arriving, I'd love if you would introduce yourself in the chat, especially if you're on Zoom, because that's where we can see it. Um, I'd love to know where you're calling from. You can tell us your name, where you are. Hi, Bri and Leela. My name's Anna, I'm in Kansas City. Super excited today. We'll give everybody just another minute or so to get online. Oh, more Missouri friends. Hi, Missouri friends. If you're just logging on, please say hi in the chat. Introduce yourself if you want. We'd love to know your name and where you're calling from. So great. Hi, Shirley. Hi, Sydney, Travis and Jenny, Mike, Emily, Val. This is great. All right, you guys, I am so glad you are all here. Uh, you can keep chatting if you'd like. Um, I think we can get started. So before we really dive in, I have one quick housekeeping note for you. So on the bottom of your screen, if you're on Zoom, you're gonna see two separate buttons. One says chat that you've already found and one says Q&A. So please use chat to talk amongst yourselves, whatever you want. Please use chat also if you have any like tech support type questions, like if your Zoom is doing something weird, please direct message IT support, which today is Emma. Um, otherwise, please put your questions, like your questions for the event. Hi, Emma. <laughs> your questions for the event in the Q&A. So those are the questions we're gonna answer live for the whole group to hear. Um, anything you want about citizen science or SciStarter, Journey North, our featured project for today, or Monarch Butterflies, or whatever you want. We'll try and answer your questions. So my name is Anna. I am your host today. I am a science communicator, which means I'm a journalist. I do a lot of marketing for science organizations and companies. And most importantly for today, I work with SciStarter and I'm a citizen scientist. Also on the call today, if we need to call them in, we can. We have Darlene, our wonderful founder. We have Emma, the SciStarter program coordinator, who's going to be helping you with IT support and whatever else. And also Roland, who's our quality assurance coordinator. So say hi to them in the chat. Um, and you three, please feel free to chime in whenever you'd like. So I would love to know, how many of you have ever participated in a citizen science project before? So a poll question, if you're on Zoom, a poll will pop up on your screen. I would love for you to answer and let me know how many of you have done citizen science before. Um, we love new people. We love old people. Oh, I get to vote. Oh, no, I don't. Oh, panelists can't vote. <laughs> Give you just a minute to answer. Now I can't actually see how many people have answered. So Emma, I will leave that up to you. We have about 19 of us. Oh, give great. us like 30 seconds to answer. 30 more seconds. Emma or Anna, can you set the chat so that people can see everybody else's comments? Right now it's just going to host and panelists. Thank you. So sorry, yes. Mm -hmm. Fix that right now. Uh, attendees, everyone. There we go. Awesome. It should work now. Thanks, Emma. All right. I think that's good for the poll. Can we see results? All right. Any? And there you go. Excellent. 
So it looks like we are about half and half. 52% have participated before, 43% um, have not, and we had one, maybe. I hear you, maybe. Sometimes you don't know. Like, what's that, citizen science? Okay, I also want to know if anybody was here last week. So we had our first Science Starter Live event last week. We had a lot of fun doing a dog project called Sea Bark. So I'd love to know if anybody here today was also here last week. Probably didn't need the maybe on this one. Hopefully you remember last week. This should be a quickie. We'll give you 45 seconds. All right, how's our results? We're about 70 75%, any last minute? One more, 10 more seconds. Okay. All right, I'm gonna end the poll. Do it. And sharing results, there you go. Oh, we got two return visitors. Thanks for coming back. It's so good to see you again. <laughs> um. No, maybe it's good. You all remember last week. Awesome. So this is an event we're going to do every single week, same time, Tuesday, same place, online. Um, you'll meet some other great hosts in the upcoming week. I'll tell you more about the upcoming events later, but um, great. Hope you'll join us again. So just quick frame of reference on what we're doing today. So citizen science, for those of you who are new, it's a collaboration between scientists and just the rest of us, uh, regular people who are curious, concerned, or motivated to make a difference. And citizen science is a really great way for people to make an impact on issues they care about all through helping science, issues like saving monarch butterflies. So if you haven't already, your first step is to join SciStarter. SciStarter is a research affiliate of Arizona State University, and it hosts an active community of over 138,000 registered citizen scientists. SciStarter has over 1,600 citizen science projects to choose from, but um, that's a big number. Don't let that overwhelm you. It's really easy to narrow down project options by your interests and your locations and things like that. So to create an account, all you have to do is hit sign up or um, log in if you already have an account up here on the top of the home page. Um, if you're signing up for the first time, be sure to enter your zip code when it asks you, because that way you can get personalized recommendations for projects and events that are special to your area. Um, and when you sign up, you can also sign up for our email newsletter that will send you just twice a month suggestions for projects to try, um, seasonal projects, fun projects, things like that. Um, once you're signed up, you are ready to go. You can start looking for projects. And I recommend doing that on the project, oops, excuse me, project finder, which is another button up here by um, sign up. So once you're in the project finder, you can search by keyword and location. And there's like a bunch of different filters. You can look at what are affiliate projects, which means your participation will get tracked in your SciStart dashboard, which is awesome, especially if you're like a points person like me, I want points for everything I do. Um, and there's a bunch of Monarch projects um, on SciStarter. So th this is just three of the first ones that came up, but these are really good ones. Monarch lar Larva Monitoring Project, Butterflies and Moths of North America, and Journey North, which we're going to do today. There's like a couple dozen, I think, Monarch projects that do all sorts of different things with monarch butterflies. Some are ways to report sightings of adult butterflies. Some are where you report sightings of caterpillars. Some you raise caterpillars, um, all sorts of stuff like that. So before we dive into any of these projects, I wanna talk a little bit about monarchs. 
Um, monarch butterflies are really, really special. And part of the reason why they're so special is because they migrate such long distances across a whole, our whole country and into parts of Canada and Mexico. So monarchs do this like many thousand mile journey over multiple generations. So most animals that we hear about migrating, it's like they're born in one place, they fly south for the winter, and then that same individual flies back. But for monarchs, the same butterfly never goes anywhere and back. They know where they're going, even though they've never been there before. It's like the grandchildren of the grandparents are the ones making the trip. It's totally crazy. So um, monarch butterflies winter in two different locations. One is in the mountains in Mexico. There's this one mountainside that's a specific forest on a specific mountain that they all congregate by the millions. Um, and they also have wintering grounds in California. Um, and then from there, they just take their couple generations to fly north for the summer when there's lots of milkweeds, lots of flowers to drink nectar from um, and move back. So I personally have always lived in sort of the northern Midwest. Um, I live in Kansas City right now, which is the farthest south I've ever lived. So I have never been lucky enough to see a big group of monarch butterflies. I would love to know if any of you have. Um, I've only ever seen one, maybe two at a time. Um, but the further south you live, the more likely you are to see a big congregation of them as they as they like gather together and get closer and closer to their breeding grounds. Um, this is something else you can report if you see it. So on Journey North, which we're gonna talk about in a second, you can report individual observations of monarch butterflies. There's also something called peak migration, where if you see a bunch of monarchs at once, they want you to like mark it as a special observation um, for, for big migration times. Monarchs, of course, love milkweeds. So the reason why monarchs love milkweeds is because it's the only plant their caterpillars will eat. So it's the only plant that they'll lay their eggs on. Um, there's a lot of different monarch, or excuse me, there's a lot of different milkweed species that are native to the United States. And depending on where you live, there might be different native milkweeds that are best for you to plant if you want to plant some in your yard. Um, they're really pretty. I highly recommend it. Um, they're nice flowers to have around, even if you didn't care about butterflies, but I'm guessing since you're here today, you do care about the butterflies. Um, these are some of my favorites. The one on the left here is just common milkweed. This is the most abundant one that you'll see. Um, you might see it growing like in a ditch somewhere, but it's totally fine to plant in your yard too. Um, this one in the middle is my favorite. This is butterfly weed that has these really bright orange, they're, they're sometimes almost red looking flowers. Um, I'll also mention a quick aside here. Don't confuse this butterfly weed with a plant called butterfly bush. You'll see butterfly bush at a lot of local nurseries. Um, and it's just like an ornamental plant for your gardens. Butterfly bush um, is not a native plant for, um, for the most part. And in a lot of areas, it can actually be invasive. So it can like escape into nature and cause problems. So make sure you're getting butterfly weed and not butterfly bush, even though butterfly bush might sound more appealing by those names. So anyway, butterfly weed is great. Um, on the right here is a showy milkweed. Um, another common one you might hear about is swamp milkweed that has real purpley flowers. That's another really pretty one. Um, yeah, so monarchs love milkweeds. I'll also mention here, monarchs will, the butterflies will eat from lots of different wildflowers and lots of different flowers. So it's not the butterflies that need the milkweed flowers. It's the butterflies laying eggs and the caterpillars that need the milkweed leaves. Um, this is also where climate change can really affect the monarch butterflies since they are migrating and they're in certain areas at certain times of year. It's really important that the plants are also alive at the same times of year. So let's say climate change can affect plants and make them like grow and bloom and die earlier than they used to. 
Now, if a monarch butterfly shows up in September in its fall migration, but the milkweeds are all already dead, then you're gonna have trouble. So something else you can do if you wanna plant milkweed for monarchs in your yard is to look up um, which species, well, first of all, which species are native to your area, but secondly, what their bloom period is, because that gives you a better sense of how long they're gonna last. So common milkweed, again, on the left here, usually only blooms like June to August, where butterfly weed might keep blooming through September, and swamp milkweed, the purple one I mentioned, can bloom all the way till October. So it's good to have a mix so you can get monarchs um, early and late in the season. Okay, enough about milkweeds. I love milkweeds. I do wanna know though, if you have any milkweed plants in your yard, I sure do. I have a whole bunch of milkweed. I didn't water it enough this year, so it's kind of dying, but... Um, you can tell me in the chat what, what species you have, if, if you know. Anna, you are welcome to join in the poll as well. I, I think you should mm -hmm. be. <gasps> yes, <Yeah>. I can. <laughs> Don't want you to not Submitted be able to my yes. that one. Yay. <laughs> yes, I see someone's got common milkweed. Oh, deer ate your milkweed. We're at 76%. Awesome. More of you. Yeah, I could look at people's milkweed all day. So you have to cut me off. Common swamp. Ooh, world. Loaded. Somebody's got world milkweed. Oh, yay. You guys have all sorts of milkweed. Love to see it. I love plants. I'm a plant nerd. Okay, let's do poll results. All righty. And here you go. I guess. Okay, we've got... About half and half again. We've got 52% yes, milkweed, 48% no, milkweed. It's okay. I forgive half of you. There's still time. You've got your whole life ahead of you to plant on milkweed. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So I also got to show you this really cute picture. So if you've never seen a monarch egg or a caterpillar, they are super adorable. They're super tiny. So the, if you're looking for eggs, it's always gonna be on the underside of a leaf. So milkweed always holds its leaves out like kind of flat, but it's always gonna be, you gotta lift it up carefully. Don't knock anybody off. And somewhere on the vein down the middle of the leaf, that's where the eggs are gonna be. Um, I don't know how the butterflies do it, but they always hit it right on the vein. And the egg is about the size of the leaf vein. So it's super tiny, it kind of camouflages. That's probably why they put it there. Um, but if you look really closely, you can see the little eggs. And so when the caterpillars first hatch, that's how big they are. They're, they were in that little bitty egg. So it's really hard to see the caterpillars when they first hatch, but they're there. You can see them with your naked eye. And then the caterpillars grow up super fast. This picture I know is a little grainy, but this was my favorite picture that I could find online that showed like all the different sizes of caterpillars. And it's crazy to me how fast they grow. So they go from that teeny tiny egg all the way to this big old mamma jamma in this picture in just two weeks. So that's a lot of milkweed that they're eating. Um, the five instars, that's just what um, entomologists or insect researchers call the different like developmental stages of caterpillars. So they go through these five stages, five instars in two weeks. So sometimes if you have a couple monarch caterpillars on your milkweeds, they will actually sort of decimate the plant, which can be a little alarming at first. If you like see your milkweed plant and it's just like a stem in the middle, all the leaves are totally eaten. But I, I promise you, it's a good thing. The monarchs are great and the plant will be fine. It'll grow back. Um, they are meant to be nommed on. They have evolved to be chewed on, so. Um, yeah, so I love monarch caterpillars. They're really gentle. You can pick them up. Um, just, just don't eat them because they are poisonous. <laughs> okay, I am ready to jump in to Journey North. Um, I also want to remind you one more time, if you have any questions that you want us to talk about at the end today, put them in the Q&A and we'll talk about them later. So Journey North, 
is super fun. So it's also very easy. You're going to love it. So if you want to follow along with me, you can. Um, also feel free to just watch and do it later. Um, but to get started, you're going to go to the Journey North project page on SciStarter. Um, it's just SciStarter.org slash journey dash north. Or you can enter Journey North in the quick navigate bar at the top of your screen, however you want to get to it. Um, once you're there, I would recommend hitting this heart button. Journey North has a lot of hearts, almost 1,200. It's a popular project. Um, and that'll save it to your liked project list on your dashboard. It's just a good way to save it for later. Um, OK, once you're ready to go, we'll hit visit. And that will let us join the project and take us to the Journey North website. So this particular project is off of SciStarter.org. So we're going to see this pop-up window that's like, you have joined the project. Are you sure you want to leave SciStarter? Yes, we are. Let's go. So the Journey North homepage looks like this. Now we are going to need to make an account before we can report any of our Monarch sightings. So this is a separate account from your SciStarter account. Um, but I promise it's worth it because it's really cool. So first, let's check out this Monarch Butterflies page. So Journey North actually has a lot of citizen science projects for a bunch of different migratory species. That's why it's called Journey North. Get it? Migration. Um, so you can report other sightings of things like um, robins and hummingbirds and other songbirds. Um, but anyway, right now we'll stick with monarchs. So here's what the Monarch Butterfly page looks like. Um, there's actually numbers hiding behind this thank you box. It says, thank you for a summer of monarch monitoring. What a great way to end a summer of monitoring monarchs. The Monarch Blitz was a success. So they had a, a big monarch event called a Blitz on August 16th. And apparently they had 2,009 participants and 4,671 observations reported. So that is awesome. Um, that's giving really good data to researchers who are working on monarch conservation. Researchers really want to know like how many monarchs are out there. That's really important for them to have a good handle on. So this sort of effort is really helpful to that. So if we scroll down on that same page, it'll tell us more information about what Journey North is looking for in terms of observations right now. So right now they're looking for um, fall monarch butterfly migration info and a little bit milkweed info. Um, fall migration for monarchs starts officially in August. So we can start recording our, our fall observations anytime now. So I'm most interested in this first category because I saw a monarch the other day and I want to report it. Let's zoom in on that. So what it says is what to report. Monarch adults cited. Where are monarchs? Report all monarch adults, that is butterflies, not eggs or larvae or caterpillars, regardless of whether migrating south. Report number of monarchs observed at a single location. And in the comments, there will be a, there will be a comment box um, on our report. Were the monarchs exhibiting directional flight? How did you estimate the number of monarchs observed? Other behaviors observed and frequency report once a week when monarchs are present. So one important note on that is you don't want to report monarchs, say, from your backyard too often because it's too hard for researchers to know if that's the same monarch that just hasn't left yet or if it's a new monarch. So they have probably done some analysis to figure out like what, what's a good frequency of data that's actually helpful. And that's how they came up with once a week. So imagine if you woke up in the morning and you saw a monarch in your yard and you reported it. And then a few hours later, you look in your yard again and there's a monarch and you reported it. Like it's probably the same butterfly, um, but it's hard to know like how, how spaced out deciding should be to be different butterflies. Anyway, so that's why once a week is a good um, benchmark for that. Now, directional flight, I'm not as familiar with. So let's click on this hyperlink. Here's what it says about directional flight. So migratory monarchs exhibit directional flight. Watch for butterflies that are traveling determinedly in a southerly direction. 
Migratory monarchs don't flit about randomly. They typically fly a beeline with a southerly heading. When the wind is blowing a butterfly off course, the position of its body often still faces in the intended direction of travel. So that's really cool. So you can actually kind of tell if a monarch is trying to migrate or if it's just, you know, hanging out in summer. So the monarch I saw the other day was, was not flying south. It flew off, I remember it flew off to the east from my backyard. So I don't think that was directional. All right, when is the last time you have seen an adult monarch? I would love to know. I saw mine last week. So I guess I have to say this month. We'll love to know how often you guys are seeing monarchs. About 60%. Awesome. It's okay if you don't really know. Don't worry, we're not submitting this data to Journey North or anything. This is just for, for funsies. My gosh, and some of you are looking at them this morning or right now. That's so Yay. exciting. <laughs> At 77%, maybe 30 more seconds. Let's do it. Darlene saw one one hour ago. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> All right, let's see the results. All righty. Ooh, this is great. All right, we've got 20% saw one today, 12% this week, 24% this month. 12% this year, it's all, it's about an even spread. 28% hasn't seen one yet this year, but has seen one ever. 4% has never seen one. Well, 4%, I hope you see one real soon because they are a real treat. So fun. Okay. Now I'm going to make you question your whole life because here's some a monarch lookalike. This always freaks me out when I'm doing citizen science because I'm, I'm so worried I'm going to see the wrong butterfly and report it. But um, the biggest monarch butterfly lookalike is called the Viceroy. And the easiest way to tell them apart is that the Viceroy has this black line crossing what's called the post-median hind wing, which is just a fancy way of saying the bottom part of its wing. So you can see sort of this line that goes like diagonally across like the pizza slice. It makes like a crust on the pizza slice, if, you, if that helps you remember. Um, I dropped in the range map here in the middle for you to see viceroys do unfortunately live in a lot of the same places as monarchs. Um, they also have a, a different flight pattern. So monarchs have a really characteristic um, flap, flap, glide pattern. You go like flap, flap, glide, flap, flap, glide. But Viceroys don't do that. They're um, faster. They're more erratic. They're just like flying all over the place. Um, viceroys are also smaller, um, but only by an inch or so. So that's not always super helpful, like unless you're looking at them side by side or, or if you're really good at telling what's two inches and what's three inches from across the yard. Um, but do, do keep an eye out for uh, viceroys. Um, there are other citizen science projects that would love your butterfly observations of non-monarchs. Um, but it's just something to keep an eye out when you're, when you're tracking monarchs, make sure it's not a vice ring. There's a couple other sort of lookalikes. I think I heard that people get painted ladies confused with monarchs. Um, I don't think they look very much alike, um, especially because the size difference is super different in my mind. Um, but also just something else to keep in the back of your mind that they are another black and orange spotty butterfly. That also lives across much of the same range. I think all of the same range looking at that map. Um, and probably the worst lookalike, although these aren't as common, is the queen butterfly. So they even have a similar name. What the heck? But um, queen butterflies are closely related to monarchs, which is why they look real similar. They're in the same genus. So they're like sister species. But um, they don't look as similar um, from the top as they do from the side. So if you live in an area with queen butterflies, you can see this map here in the lower left, um, do try and catch a glimpse of the back of, which is probably a more technical term than the back, 
the back of the butterflies to make sure um, it's a monarch and not a queen. So they're a lot darker. They have this like solid, dark, orangey, almost brown looking back. Okay, so now that I have you freaked out that all your monarchs are actually viceroys, don't freak out, it's okay. Um, we are gonna log our monarch sighting for today. So I'm back here at the Journey North homepage. Now I'm going to go to report sightings. So I created my account earlier. If you hadn't already done that, you'll create an account here at this step. Um, and the form is super easy. So I will fill in with these three drop down menus first. My species is monarch butterfly. My sighting is fall monarch adult. Um, and the year is 2022. So I'll hit continue. And it will now ask me for a little bit more information about my sighting. So I will type in my address into the location bar. You can also just like move the map around and find it. Um, put in the date. This is not an accurate date. I sadly did not see one this morning. I saw it last week. Um, I only saw one because I only ever see one. I'm jealous of all of you who have a bunch in your yard. Um, I'm pretending that I took this epic photo. Don't worry, I'm not submitting my fake observation to Journey North. This was just to have a pretty photo to show you. Um, upload the photo. Um, I'll also mention, don't feel like your photo has to be pretty to submit it. Sometimes researchers can glean a lot of information from even kind of a crummy photo. And it is just sort of encouraging to have like a little bit of proof. So they're not gonna print it out and frame it and put it on their wall, but um, it's nice to have the photo. And if we scroll down a bit, the last bit of the form is just the comment box. So if you remember the slide earlier that showed the little description of what they were looking for in the comments, it asked for whether we saw directional flight. It asked for if you saw more than one, how did you count it? And if there were any other behaviors observed. So I, like I said earlier, I don't think I saw a directional flight. I'm pretty sure I watched it fly away out of my garden to the east. So I don't think that counts since it wasn't south. Um, it definitely stopped and sipped nectar from my blazing star plant. So I'll mention that. And that's about all I have. There were no other behaviors. Um, something else that you could report, I just saw, um, I had two yellow butterflies in my yard, big yellow butterflies. Tell me in the chat if you think you know what that is. I've been meaning to look them up, but there were two of them and they were flying around each other in circles. So I would definitely report that if I saw something like that with monarchs. Um, the counting thing is interesting to me. So I think they want to know how good you are at estimating, like if there are a lot, if there's like a thousand butterflies, if you live somewhere in the South where they're starting to congregate, I think it's a fair question. Like why, like how did you come up with a thousand? Like, is that just, you looked at it and you had a feeling or did you like pick out 10 and then you multiplied it or, or what? So I, I think that's why I asked you to tell you how that you estimated the numbers. Um, but like I said, I've never been so lucky to see a thousand at once. Okay, so that's the whole report. You have just participated in Journey North. You submit report, you are donezo. It's super easy. Um, I can't wait to give them my observations when I when I see my butterfly again. I haven't seen it in a few days. I'm, I'm mad. I wanted to submit a, a real observation for you today, but um, yeah, so that's Journey North. Before we move to our Q&A and start chatting, I wanted to mention a few other resources that you can find from SciStarter. SciStarter is just full of resources. So if you ever get stuck on this project or any project, um, there's a couple of things you can do. First of all, you can ask the SciStarter community. So at the bottom of every project page, there's a comment box and you can leave a review. You can ask a question. Um, somebody is watching those and we'll answer it. Anybody can answer those questions. Um, so that's one way to get help. Second option is to ask the project leaders directly. So also on the SciStarter project page, there's a button that says message project. It's right under the visit button that we hit earlier. 
Um, and I'm pretty sure that it just goes straight to the project leader's email inbox. So you can contact them there. Um, you can also ask SciStarter. SciStarter exists to do this, to help you figure out your citizen science projects and help you get connected with these opportunities. So you can always email SciStarter at info at SciStarter.org. Um, also, if you want more to do, uh, we really recommend you take some of our training courses. SciStarter has these awesome little training modules. That we, we say courses, but it's it's short. It's like one hour. Um, if you go to SciStarter.org slash training, there's a Foundations of Citizen Science, which is a great way to sort of jumpstart your citizen science career if, if you're new. Um, there's a couple other ones. We just added one on data literacy, uh, which is cool, like how to understand data, things like that. Um, yeah, once you're ready to find more projects, go back to that project finder, sciestarter.org slash finder, and find something else to do. We also have some more Monarch resources because everybody loves Monarchs. Um, we've got a pollinator coloring page, which we will link for you. We also posted this on Facebook. You might have already seen it. Um, if you want to do some coloring. And there's also a library kit for observing pollinators. So if you're not familiar with the library kits, um, at participating libraries across the country, they have these like pre-packaged little kits that you can check out and it helps you do a specific citizen science project. So there are um, pollinator observation themed kits. And if you go to the SciStarter website, it'll tell you like which libraries have them and which kits are available, things like that. Last but not least, I have to tell you about some upcoming events. So like I said earlier, we are doing this every week. So please mark your calendars, come back and see us again. For the next three weeks, we are doing a back to school series. You will not be hearing from me. We'll have some other lovely hosts. Um, first one will be focused on middle schoolers, then the following two weeks, high schoolers, and then college age. So these are intended for both students and parents and teachers um, with projects aimed for that age group. And if you go to our blog, blog.sitestarter.org, we have a post there that's gonna always have information about upcoming events and like registration links and things like that. So I think that's all my news. Thanks for watching. We are so glad you came. We'll go answer some Q&A questions now. Um, okay, last note, I promise, we are going to have a post event survey if you're on Zoom, it'll pop up automatically and it'll just ask you a couple questions like, hey, did you like this event? Um, please fill that out. That really helps us make sure events are better next time. Okay, cool. So I'll leave this up for a minute. We can go to our Q&A. While we're waiting for anyone to put in any questions into the uh, Q&A or in the chat, you're welcome to write it in the chat as well. Um, but uh, I just have a question. How do you tell the difference between a moth and a butterfly? Is that wasn't all you discussed? That's a good question. So, ooh, this is going to take me back. So I know <laughs> a big part of it is their antennas. So I think monarchs have like stringy antennas and moths have feathery antennas. Um, I think there's other differences, but none are coming to mind. Yeah. But antenna is a big one. Um, I know a lot of times moths are nocturnal and butterflies are active in the day, but that's not, it's not like 100%. a sure, yeah, it's not hundred percent. It's not guaranteed. Awesome. Yeah. I've seen some very wild butterflies and later come to find out that they are moths and I'm like, oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm always uh, surprised with caterpillars too. I think I don't, I don't know if there's a way to tell butterfly and moth caterpillars apart. I don't know either. I'm not yeah. sure. I've seen a lot of moth caterpillars and I guess regular ones or uh, butterfly caterpillars as well. And they're all beautiful. So um, some of you are asking about uh, the recording of this session. This will be uploaded to YouTube in our SciStar uh, events playlist, but we'll send it via, um, I'll send um, a link to it in the uh, comments of this Facebook live event, as well as in a follow-up email since you registered for it. Mm -hmm. um, so that'll be going out to you. And then Valerie, can we get a copy of Migration Map and Monarch Viceroy slide? Absolutely. Those I were can... both resources from Journey North. 
actually I Googled those and got them from Journey North, but we can also give you a copy easily. I'll definitely send that. Yeah. Um, we can add the slides, um, the link to this or a PDF copy of the slides there. Oh, good idea. In the in the follow up email. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Val in the chat says moths, moth caterpillars have no, just moths. Moths have bulkier, hairier bodies. I do remember that. They're like they're um, more likely to be fuzzy and sort of like I don't know, fat, fat looking. Monarchs are just so so easy because they're like sleek, like sleek bodies, sleek antennas. Moths can be more like stumpy. No offense. It's, they're it's, beautiful. That's rude. They're stumpy. <laughs> they are so beautiful, moths. <laughs> Um, any other questions? Anybody planning on using the pollinator work uh, color coloring sheet? I know I would. Oh, Michael asked if my yellow butterflies were tiger swallowtails. No, they were not. I do know swallowtails. They were solid, like creamy butter yellow, but kind of big, like big, like a not maybe not as big as a monarch or a swallowtail, but. Yeah, I don't know. Wildless sulfur, that could be. Val melts her, her stuff. Yes, definitely could have been this. So fun, thank you, Val. I know more about monarchs than I do about other things because honestly, it's because I know about milkweeds. My, my background is in prairie plants. So I, I only know about monarchs because I know about plants. <laughs> Are there any questions on Facebook? Mm, oh, yes, <laughs> there are. Uh, has anything been taught about, oh, sorry. Uh, has anything been taught about the anatomy, especially skeleton for lack of a better word, like exoskeleton, so abdomen structure of butterflies as they compare with other features and how they move and fly? Oh, during this event, Angela? Um, we have, we did not talk about that and I am afraid I don't know too much about. Another lepidopterans are part of the insect mm -hmm, mm -hmm. group. So that would mean. Unfortunately, that's outside of my abdomen. <laughs> my, my new best friend Val also put in the chat uh, to plant <laughs> asters and goldenrod for migrator, migrating adult monarchs. This is so true. This is a killer wildflower garden combination, asters and goldenrods. And they also are really pretty. It's like my favorite color combo. So asters come in um, blues and purples and sometimes whites. I really like the blue and purple ones, especially um, New England aster is my personal favorite, bright purple. And then the goldenrods are like the color of my shirt. They're like gold, golden yellow. And those flowers bloom at the same time in late summer and fall and monarchs love them and they just look epic. So I've actually been trying to put a lot of those in my yard ever since I moved here. Uh, for any of you who have uh, pollinator gardens, does anybody want to do the hand raise if they have a pollinator garden in the, in the participants list? I want to see how many of us do. I do. I have one plant. Does that count? It counts. It's a start. You got to start somewhere. Got one, two, three, of course, it's Val. Yes. <laughs> we transformed wow. one acre of our 12 acre meadow into a poly pollinator garden. Wow. Oh, yeah. So well, even having a 12 acre, look, even, even having a 12 acre meadow is awesome, but uh, I would love to see it. It's so fun. Ooh, so I'm just browsing the chat now. Um, Emily mentioned earlier that Viceroy host plant is willow trees. So that can be another hint. Like if you are seeing a monarch or a maybe Viceroy butterfly around, um, if there's a lot of willow trees around, that can be another hint that you should be extra careful, check that it's a Viceroy. There were a couple of comments in the chat about where to find uh, libraries with pollinator kits. Um, the website for pollinator kits, or rather for library kits is, um, we'll put it in the chat and also in the, uh, uh oh, 
I'm sorry. Uh, Roland, my friend, would you mind adding that into the chat? My screen just went dark. Oh, Darlene. Um, oh, yeah. Thank you, Darlene. Yeah, oh, everything Roland also got it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. If you go to scistarter.org forward slash library, that's a great resource for both librarians who want to get the kits. So it's a good way to encourage your library to go ahead and create the kits. There's no, there's no charge that we just put everything online so they can see how to build them and assemble them. And we provide all kinds of great free materials for that. Or if you want to find the kits that are available and the library locations, I put a specific li link in there, which is the last one that you see there, scistarter.org forward slash library hyphen map. But I would also check your local library because we know there's a lot of libraries that haven't registered on that map yet. But obviously you can do all these projects without the kit, but it is fun to do them with the kit. Definitely. Cool. I also saw a couple of comments about um, tussock moths. And so I thought I'd mention there's, there's other insects that also eat milkweeds other than monarch butterfly caterpillars. Um, there's no need to worry about them. You don't need to like pick off other insects to leave some for the monarchs. Like it's totally fine. Um, milkweeds can get sort of problems with aphids. There's a, um, these orange aphids. I'm going to forget their name. It's like oleander, something like that. Val knows, she'll tell me in the chat. Um, but these little orange aphids, they're not native, um, but they won't kill the plant usually. So if, if they're ugly in your garden and they're bothering you, you can just like pull them off or some people say you can spray them off, um, but you don't like ecologically, you don't need to get rid of them. But there's also a couple different milkweed beetles that are red and black that will, you might see hanging out on your milkweeds, um, tussock moth caterpillars, which are fuzzy fuzzy little caterpillars, um, you can just leave them. They like your garden too, just like the butterflies. We also have a list of pollinator garden uh, related projects in the chat as well. It's the scistarter.org slash pollinator gardens will lead you to some projects there. Yeah, I just wanna give a big shout out too to Roland. I'm not sure what time it is there, but Roland is doing all this work here, putting in all these links from Lebanon. <laughs> so thank you. Thank, thank you, Roland. Oh, what time is it, Roland, there? It, it's 10, 10 p.m. Oh, OK. Not too bad, but pretty late. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. OK, everybody, if that's all our questions. Anything else from Facebook? Mm. I don't see anything, but let me just double check. I miss something. Mm -hmm. Nope, I don't think so. Cool. I grew up regularly going to Monarch Butterfly Grove in Pismo Beach. Oh, I love Pismo Beach. Thanks for sharing, Julia. Uh, so amazing to see so many monarchs in one place. I didn't see any, and I was there a couple weeks ago. Oh, ah, I'm jealous. <laughs> or at least I wasn't paying attention. To be fair, I have a um, a favor towards caterpillars as opposed to uh, butterflies and moths because I'm crazy apparently. Uh, but that's awesome. <laughs> it's okay. Some caterpillars need fans too. <laughs> yeah. Okay, team. Well, I think we will call it a day and hope to see you all next week. Again, next week is middle school, back to school, middle school. Um, and you'll find all upcoming events on our website. So thanks for coming. Yeah. We'll see you later. And and please take the survey at the end of the event. When you close out, it should just pop up. But thank you all to see. You got my email. Oh, thank you, Val, for letting us know. I'll look into that. Okay. Oh, I had to miss a lot. Will this be viewable again? Yeah, Rachel, we're going to um uh this is being recorded and we'll put it on YouTube and send it out via our registration. Anyone who registered for the event will receive a follow-up email and I'll also add the links onto, um, or onto, or most of them have been added onto the uh, Till I Start Live, or sorry, the live stream of this on Facebook. But you will receive one. I'm recording. Okay. okay. Thanks all. Goodbye. Right, I'm gonna go ahead and pause, stop the recording.